Myr Games, and I'm here on, what is it, Wednesday, May the 3rd, very close to May the 4th, which is a very nice coincidence for one of the main topics that I will discuss today. Um, I'll wait until a few people join in, but overall, what, one of the things that I, I am so excited to share is that this past weekend, I went to the Star Wars Galactic Star Cruiser experience in Orlando, Florida at Disney World. And I'll talk about more about what that is in a second, but I'm going to plant that little seed right now while you're joining in or while you're getting warmed up for this video if you're watching on YouTube. And I'll jump around to a few other topics before I dive deep into that. Hi, Tony. Hi, Steven. Thank you for, for joining me this morning. Um, still my, I've been, so I was away this week as I've been catching up on a lot of just random Stillmeyer Games stuff. Uh, you know, blog posts and videos. I did a video about the Star Wars experience yesterday. A uh, lot of emails to catch up on. Lots of, lots of little things. I'm just trying to see if I have anything in particular that's interesting, but it's mostly just catching up on comments and posts and things like that. So um, no, no big behind the scenes stuff happening in some of our games. And as I'm saying that, I'm realizing that I totally forgot to send the e-newsletter. That's how, that's how off I am because I got back at the end of the day on Monday. And so today doesn't entirely feel like a Wednesday. Yeah, but when it isn't just any Wednesday, it's actually it's Wednesday of the beginning of the month when we send our e-newsletter, which I have prepared fortunately. So while I'm talking here for a second, I will load that up um, and send it so that people can join in live while I'm talking about this fun stuff. I don't mention actually the Star Cruiser in the in the e-newsletter. So people joining us won't necessarily have context for that. But yeah, let me get this e-newsletter out so we can uh, have other things to talk about. All right, here we go. I ha we, we've been working on it all week, so it is definitely ready. And I am sending it now. There we go. It is sent. People will probably start to get it and show up with the, the, the mention of it in the um, in the e-newsletter a little bit later. But all right, so we, we have that up here. So you should soon, in a few minutes, be getting a monthly e-newsletter from us, which doesn't have any, so this is kind of a quieter e-newsletter. I talk a little bit about Scythe and Expeditions. I'm trying to welcome people into the world of Scythe if they haven't played it already. Not that you need to have played Scythe to play Expeditions, but I think it's a fun compliment. It's like watching the, the first of a series of movies before you watch the sequel. Talk about that a little bit in the newsletter. Talk about Geekway to the West as well. Um, Geekway is coming up in a few weeks. It's now too late to actually sign up to attend Geekway, but it was more like if you're attending Geekway, I would love to play a game with you, or I'd love to at least see you. Um, so there's a little bit about that and some other random topics. If you see anything in the newsletter, once you get it, I have it up on my other screen here and I can refer to it. Looks like Corel is joining us from Belgium. Corel and I talk all the time about Rolling Realms and Corel is working on the Wingspan fan art pack and the Tapestry Civ adjustments. Thank you, Corel, for, for helping out so much around here at Stomar Games over the last few months and the last year with Rolling Realms. I really appreciate that. I'm glad you could be here today. Um, Tony says, how could it possibly be May? Wasn't it just a Valentine's Day last week? The year has seemed to fly by. Yeah, we have, we're four months into the year already. Um, that it, it doesn't, I feel like I haven't done enough, really. That's not, whatever I think about time, I'm like, I, I wish I had more of it. I wish I could have done more with the time that I had. Um, and so, yeah, Tony, that's quite a reminder. George Ray, good morning. Uh, Steven says, is that the Star Wars Hotel? Uh, Carlos says, so much envy about your Star Wars experience. Julie says, good morning. So, yeah, let me tell you the, the context for what this Star Cruiser experience is. So, yes, it is, it is, among other things, it is also a hotel. It is a hotel. So, you sign up for two days for the Star Wars Galactic Star Cruiser experience. It's in Orlando, Florida. Two days. And you enter... Like once you arrive, you are basically treated as if you've shown up on um, it, at a it, at a galactic cruise, so that, that they pretend that you are going to outer space on an outer space starship star cruiser. And so, as soon as you arrive, you kind of get into this shuttle that feels like you're going to outer space a little bit without any g-force really. Um, uh, it's, it's an elevator, and it takes you into the hotel. And from then on, for the next two days. You feel like, and they really, really do, you feel like that you are in a spaceship. The, the set design is absolutely incredible. From the public spaces to the dining areas to your rooms, everything is, uh, is uh, 
made to feel like you were all in a starship. And a small example of how well done this is, is that there's a bridge to the ship that you can go on at certain times. And there's a giant movie theater sized screen that you're actually interacting with on the bridge. And when you're not interacting with it, you're kind of looking out into outer space and seeing ships and planets go by. And sometimes things happen on that screen. And when things happen on that screen, they happen at the right angle on every screen in the ship. So there are screen, the, like the windows in your hotel room are screens that are showing you outer space and they are synced with the main like events and things happening on the bridge itself. So at all times, you are part of a giant collective experience um, of going into outer space in this hotel. I'll come back to a little bit more of what the other levels are in a second. Um, and really, I could talk for quite some time about it. I filmed a video about it yesterday that I thought would be around 20 to 30 minutes. It was a 50 minute video that might come out this Sunday if it's ready um, in terms of editing and visuals and whatnot, but there's a lot to say about it. Uh, Jeff says he's visiting the St. Louis area. What non-obvious things should I check out? Well, Jeff, I always have a handy little um, food guide. It's mostly a food guide, but there's also some touristy stuff on it as well. Let me see if I can find it here. Uh, where do I keep it? I have a little Google Doc that I share here. It's called St. Louis Food Recommendations, but there's more on it as well. And Jeff, one thing that I would add is... Uh, or that, that I think is on the list, is that if you're into disc golf, uh, I've been playing disc golf for a few years now, I really enjoy it. We sell Stillmeyer Games discs. Um, there are some great courses to go to in St. Louis. That's maybe a non-obvious St. Louis thing. There are lots of good disc golf courses at various skill levels. If you're not into disc golf, let me know a few of the things that you are into, and maybe I can suggest some ways for you to take uh, to experience your hobbies here in St. Louis. And one of them, if you're joining us for the live cast, probably is board gaming, tabletop gaming. And I would highly rec recommend the Pieces Board Game Bar and Cafe. It's a great little St. Louis place that uh, that is great for gamers. Elaine says, he says, oh my, I've watched most YouTube videos for the Star Cruise, or I hope one did to experience. And I would say the videos and photos kind of partially do it justice. Um, Oh, Jeff says he is at into disc golf. Jeff was just at the uh, the Jonesboro Open tournament this past weekend, the, the pro tournament. Well, Jeff, there, there are lots of good courses in St. Louis, including probably the best one if you are already decent at disc golf is Unger, U-N-G-E-R. That's a great course. And if you're just looking for like a little short course, Watson Park is a really nice little short course that isn't too easy. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a fun one. But yeah, so the so Star Wars Star Cruiser, the Gothic Star Cruiser, it is a hotel. Um, that makes you feel like you're in outer space. But it is also, uh, it's kind of a, a living movie that you participate in on many different levels throughout the, the two days. And, and it's an intense two days. Like it, it, it doesn't, two days doesn't feel like a long time, but it, it feels like we were there for a long time because you have like these big cinematic moments that everyone is kind of watching as they happen. But you also have, uh, you have, uh, training experiences that are cued to you on this app. So this app says like, hey, it's time for your lightsaber training. And I actually did get a lightsaber. I built my own lightsaber that I have here. I'm not really like a, a, a person who collects things. I don't really want things other than games for the most part, but I really wanted to build my own lightsaber and see what it felt like. And uh, the cats hate it, but I think it's awesome. So I, I built this. This isn't something that you actually build on the, uh, the Star Cruiser, but you do get lightsaber training on the Star, Tru on the Star Cruiser. I learned how to play Sabacc, uh, the Star Wars game, um, and I had uh, bridge training. So you have all these little things that you can do at certain times. There are also optional events that you can do, like the Sabacc tournament was an optional event that I just decided to do. And all the events are like 10 to 15 minutes. So there's plenty of room to like, or time to jump into something for a little bit and then jump into something else. And then there's also on this Datapad app that you have on your phone, there are all these characters that are asking you to go on these little mini missions, like go to the engineering room and do something for them, or go to this place to do something for them. And if you do that, uh, the, the hotel is reading what you've done thanks to what you put into the app and also what you've scanned into your little wristband here. And it's continuing the story for how you're interacting with those specific characters. So you can go deep with a specific character. You can ignore other characters or depending on kind of which side or which faction you choose on the ship and you're choosing multiple factions along the way. It's not like you're just choosing one. Um, it'll give you different activities that you can do. So there's that level and, and 
and that that level is, is a lot of fun like it's really fun to, to pursue these storylines both on the star cruiser and when they drop you off at galaxy's edge for a little bit on on the the second day um but there's also you can go even deeper into the story because those that like the program that is sending you those messages from the cast or the crew uh those cast members are actually also there on the ship with you uh just being a part of of the experience with you and they are leading little missions uh, that are that are separate from the app so that you might see people clustering around one of these cast members and you can just drift over to them and they might be like okay we, we need to hide this specific thing on the ship right now let's go and do it and you all go do it together and you participate in it um and even deeper than that and i this is the level that i didn't quite go this deep uh is that you can really get to know these cast members really well. They're just, they're people, but they're in character and they are great actors and really nice people. And they can give you secret missions and secret messages and these much more private experiences with them as well. If you get to know them on a personal level. So they're kind of gauging, they are gauging your desired level of participation. And you are also kind of figuring out your, your own level of participation along the way. It's a giant meta game that is impeccably designed, incredible design. And uh, as you can tell, I had a blast doing it. And I, I was genuinely surprised by how many layers there were to this game. I'll come back to a few other things that I that are particularly memorable in a second. But yeah, I'm talking about the Star Wars Galactic Star Cruiser experience that I went on with eight friends uh, this past weekend. Or seven friends and Megan. Uh, Megan was there too. Uh, Dayton said, I talked about Geekway to the West, the convention that... Um, that I'm attending in a few weeks here in St. Louis. Dayton says that his wife will be there, but he has to work and unfortunately can't go. I'm sorry to hear that, Dayton. That's too bad. Ray says, I'm not sure if you're a fan of the John Wick movies. I do enjoy the John Wick movies. He says, I saw chapter four this past weekend. He says it was amazing and didn't drag at all despite the running time. There were back-to-back -back action scenes that were unlike anything I had ever seen. Ooh, I'm, I, I'm really excited to see that, Ray. Is it, uh, did you see it in the theater or is it now on... Um, you know, on streaming or whatnot. I, I don't mind paying for it on streaming. I just, I think I may have missed it in the theaters at this point. Steven says he recommends Lost Stars. This is a great book to read and listen to for Star Wars fans. Thank you for that recommendation. Yeah, I'll make a note about that. Lost, Lost Stars. Stars. Journey to Star Wars, The Force Awakens, Lost Stars. Awesome, yeah, thank you for that recommendation. And that looks like it takes place in the same time period as the, little, as the story that we engage with on the Star Cruiser, which is kind of around movies 7, 8, 9. I think it might be technically between 8 and 9, as far as I know. Hey, my friend Adam is here. Adam was one of the, the amazing friends who were here, part of this experience. experience. Uh, he says white wampas represent. We had a bridge training at one point um, where we had a bunch of mini games on the bridge, some of which were on the big screen, some of which were like buttons and knobs that you're twisting and pulling. And we had different groups. Our group happened to be called the White Wampas. That was a name given to us, not a name that we assigned to ourselves. Um, but I want to give credit to Adam and the other, other friends who joined me on this. Uh, a big part of the experience was with, for me was going with these people who I thought would have a great time with it and who I thought would dive deep into the, into it. Um, because I, I think to really enjoy the Star Cruiser experience, you do have to say yes a lot. You have to say, yes, I'm going to try this. Yes, I'm going to I'm gonna be okay with dressing up for the weekend. I'm not someone who usually dresses up. I don't really play role-playing games, but I invited people who are really into them because I thought that would be more fun. I thought it would be fun for them and more fun for me if I were with people who were into that type of thing. And um, both those friends and the other uh, and the cast members and the crew and the other people on the ship, all the other guests, I thought all did an amazing job at making it a special experience for, for me and for everyone who was there. Um, so yeah, thank you, Adam and, and, and other friends who, uh, who, who were part of this. Uh, Jay says, as someone who hasn't done disc golf but is interested in trying it, which Stonemaier games discs are essential? So Jay, I would recommend getting three total discs. And I don't necessarily have specific discs for you, um, but you can see on the discs, and hopefully I label this well on the website, there are uh, uh, drivers. So those are discs that you throw long distances. So you want to get one of those. You want to get one mid-range or approach disc. And so there's, I, uh, I think the side of the disc is out of stock, but there, there are some mid-range discs like the Tapestry disc. Um, is Tapestry mid-range? No, I'm thinking of the wrong one. Pendulum is mid-range. 
Um, so you want one of those and you want a putter, like the Green Gully putter. So those are for very short distances. So you only really need three discs to play disc golf for quite some time. And then if you really like it, you can get more discs. If you don't like it, you don't, you don't, uh, then you've only had three discs that you, <laughs> that you don't use. Yeah. Jeff says, is there anywhere to get the Stonemaier discs in person? I appreciate you asking that, Jeff. Currently there isn't. We are still working on figuring out local pickup. Our fulfillment center happens to be miniature market. We've outsourced out our warehouse and fulfillment to them. And so Miniature Market does do local pickup for their products, but they don't do it for our products yet. So we're working on that, but we're not there yet. So unfortunately, no, there isn't a way to pick them up. Sam popped in to say hi. Glad you had an awesome weekend. Um, did you have any takeaways from the experience that you could that you could apply to immersion in board games? I was helping reset a copy of Mechs vs. Minions for a local game cafe, and the acceptance letter you get when you open the box is a nice touch. Yeah, I love little touches like that. And that's a great corollary to what I experienced with the, the Star Cruise, the, the Star Wars Star Cruiser. Um, the, the little thematic touches like that, I think, make a big difference. In Lands of Galzir, I played that recently. They had something like that, too. There's a little brochure welcoming you into the world. Um, and also onboarding. I, there's a lot that I observed and experienced about onboarding people into the experience while I was there at the Star Cruiser that I think definitely applies to board games. So, like... When you get there, when you when you arrive at the Star Cruiser, the cast or the crew members that greet you are already in character, but they aren't too far in character yet. Like they're kind of saying, okay, this is, they're preparing you for um, the role playing element of it, but they're not diving in too deep. Um, and even one of them asked a question, they, they said, as we lined up, they said, who here is a Star Wars fan? Who here loves Star Wars? And we raised our hands. And then they said, and who is here because you're with someone who loves Star Wars? And other people raised their hands. And I love that they asked that because they were, from the very beginning, they were actively saying, uh, you are welcome here no matter your connection to Star Wars. Obviously, if you're here, you're connected to Star Wars in some way, but it might not be you. It might be someone else that you're with. I don't exactly know the exact corollary to board games there, but I think we probably have all played board games with someone who isn't quite into board games as much as we are. And having games um, be accessible to those people, the same games that we love as, as deep experienced board gamers, be fun for people who aren't as deep into it. Um, I think that's a, a crucial lesson. And just there were many other levels of onboarding. Like I mentioned the the lightsaber training. Here's my, my lightsaber. Uh, we Everybody did the lightsaber training, training at different times, but that prepared us for something else that might happen later, that might be a part of your story later. And like the bridge training, we learned how to work all those knobs and buttons on the bridge for an event that might happen later. And I say might because each person's storyline is a little bit different. I, my my storyline may not have culminated with something that happened on the bridge and some, some other people's storylines did or didn't. And so having those like low pressure situations where you're learning to get these things to work for the real deal when it happens later is really cool. And that definitely applies to board games, giving you um, like easy things to do early on in the game so you can learn how to get good at them for when it matters late in the game when you need to score a lot of points from those things, that type of thing. Chad says, was there any sci-fi food that you particularly enjoyed or remembered? Yes, Chad, I'm glad you prompted me about this because when I travel, I think a lot about food. I want to try different foods and different flavors. And we were going into outer space. And so we were trying food from a variety of different planets. And the food on the Star Cruiser was amazing. Uh, it didn't just taste good. It looked really really good too like the the design of each of the dishes looked otherworldly but also familiar so you kind of knew what you were eating um but it also looked different than how that dish would normally be served um lots of little desserts that i thought were particularly good there's the uh in the force awakens ray makes that little bread that little puff bread that puffs up there were a couple different breads that looked like that and had different things inside um, or nothing inside there were we had blue shrimp at dinner one night we had um Trying to think of food that looked particularly otherworldly. Like it all looked like it was made to be otherworldly. But um, what were some of the other things that looked otherworldly? Well, we had the blue and the green milk. There's blue and green milk. And if you go to uh, Galaxy's Edge, which is the general Star Wars place at Disney, you can buy blue or green milk. But we had it on tap all the time whenever we wanted it at on the Star Cruiser. So whenever you wanted a little blue or green milk, which isn't actually a dairy product. It's more like a, a smoothie. Um you could have it. So that, that was really good. Uh, just, I, I'll have to share some photos of the food. I'll, I, I, there's some in the video, but there, there were just lots of dishes that looked and tasted delicious and looked a little otherworldly. I'm trying to think of what else. Oh, I had a really good, um, 
butternut squash soup with a granola bar on one of the days. That was surprisingly good. It was really good. Uh, I'll have to go back and look at the photos because the, the, the cafeteria serves lots of different food items and small servings so you can try a lot of them. A par is popping in to say that he and his wife just got tickets to go to his first ever board convention. It's in Lin, it's called Lincoln and it's here in Sweden from May 17th to 20th. So if anyone else is going to Lincoln, feel free to say hi to par here. That's awesome. Um, I hope your first convention goes well and that uh, everyone does a good job of including you in the experience. I think it uh, can be a little daunting the first time you go to one of these conventions. It certainly was for me, um, but I hope you have fun. Okay, Chad says, he says, you chose a green blade for the lightsaber. So here's the lightsaber that I built at Galaxy's Edge. And indeed, I do have a green kyber crystal in here. Um, however, I will say I was building it together with Megan. And Megan plays green when she plays games. And so I was the one kind of building the lightsaber, although we, we were both doing it together. Um, but I chose green for her. I play red in board games. And so uh, one of my friends gave me a red kyber crystal that I can put into the lightsaber when I'm feeling uh, a little uh, mischievous. I, I don't think I identify with, like red lightsabers are typically identified with like kind of evil things in Star Wars universe. Not always, but sometimes. And that isn't what I'm really going for. But, um, but I do like playing the color red in tabletop games. Uh, Brian says, do you play video games and or have you checked out the new Jedi Survivor game? I, uh, I I don't play many video games, and so I haven't played that particular game. I think the last Star Wars video game that I played was probably like the pod racing game in college, which I greatly enjoyed. But no, I haven't played. I, I've uh, watched some videos about Jedi Survivor just because it looked like a cool game, but I haven't played it yet. Have you played it? Do you do you are you enjoying it so far? Dayton says that his family loves the Star Wars area at WDW. What's WDW? Uh, we're. Walt Disney World. Okay, Disney World. But I haven't made it to the Star Cruiser yet. We've made three lightsabers. That's awesome. Yeah, the lightsaber experience is, I think it's worth doing at Galaxy's Edge. It may have been one of my favorite things at Galaxy's Edge, along with the Rise of the Resistance ride, which I thought was really cool. Um, and while we were at Galaxy's Edge, we had all these missions and side quests that we were trying to accomplish, or if we wanted to, that impacted our experience back on the Star Cruiser. Um, so we had all these kind of tasks and jobs that we were trying to do while we were there. We also went to Oga's Cantina at uh, Galaxy's Edge. Um, and we ordered, there were nine of us, and there are nine alcoholic drinks at Oga's Cantina. And so we ordered all nine of them, and we just kind of tried different drinks. They're very light drinks. There's not much alcohol in them, which is fine, because they I was there more to drink delicious otherworldly drinks anyway. Oh, wow. Chad says he built a lightsaber from scratch. He even wired it. That's incredible, Chad. Well done. George says, is the entire experience for two days always, and then it resets and other folks are joining, or can you book for more than two days if you want? It is just two days. So it's uh, a two-day two hotel experience. There's some time on Galaxy's Edge. And for a good, I would say six hours every day is the most intense part of the uh, kind of the cast-driven experiences. So there, it's a total of 12 hours of really like uh, fairly intense or as intense as you want it to be story and mission driven experience with the cast. Um, and yeah, it is just for two days. You've kind of told the whole story at that time and they reset and they tell the same story every time. But I think each individual story can end up being quite different depending on who you engage with and the other people around you. Um, I think that can make a big difference. And that's why I think I've heard that some people do go back and do it multiple times. For me, I probably wouldn't do it again unless they introduced a new storyline. Um, it is an expensive vacation. It's an expensive two days for sure. Uh, I think if you put four people in, in, in a room, it's probably the most efficient way to do it. Or five people if they'll let you do it. You get, there are five beds in, in one of the rooms. Um, but it, be, because of that, and there are many other places in the world that I want to go and experience and see that it isn't something I'd do again unless they did a new story, like a Mandalorian storyline or an episode four, five, six storyline, that uh, that would be that would be worth doing for sure. But I had people that I went with who said that they would do this again after a couple of years. They would do it again, even if it was the exact same story, because the way they experience it could be very different. We did all dress up in costume too, uh, 
And that was really fun. Like, I, I, I don't usually cosplay at all. Like, maybe on Halloween I'll dress up. But it was really fun to be in costume because it, there are so many other people doing it and joining in that part of the experience. And your costume could help people identify the way that you wanted to participate. So, for example, there were certain times that uh, we didn't want the First Order to find out that we were doing something. And... When, whenever that would happen, a cast member would look around and they might look at someone else in the room who was dressed up in a First Order costume. Or if they weren't, they would find a stormtrooper to point out or something like that. And they would ask someone in the group to go distract that person so that they wouldn't see the little thing that we were doing. And so it was all just play. We were all just playing. Um, but it that we felt like we were participating in these little groups where we were trying to do these little missions. And someone who who a, a fellow guest who might just be happen to be dressed up as an officer in the first order they would suddenly be pulled into that story even as we're trying to like kind of push them away and distract them like they're pulled into that story uh anyway it, it's just incredible to see the different ways that you can participate depending on how you dress up at uh at the uh, the galactic star cruiser uh brett brent says the best part is the choices you make on the star cruiser to help the resistance you can choose you can choose the opposite and have a different experience yes exactly yeah you can help the resistance you can help the first order you can um that you can be more of a smuggler slash scoundrel which is what i did and there are other other like sub storylines too involving um the uh the person running the cruise she has some stuff that you can do there's a group of uh force aware people called the saja that have different things you can do they were the ones that did the lightsaber training again if you're just joining me now and you're wondering what the heck i'm talking about uh this past weekend i went to the star wars galactic star cruiser experience and really i'm calling it a meta game like it's a, a fully immersive meta game kind of like westworld but in star wars and uh i i just had one of the most amazing weekends of my life it was absolutely incredible and so I'm just raving about it in different ways, hopefully in a ways that aren't too boring for all of you. By now, all of you probably should have gotten the monthly e-newsletter, which I have on my other screen here. And if you uh, have any thoughts or questions about the content there, I'm happy to answer them as well. It wasn't a big month for big news or anything like that. Uh, let's see. Mark says he's just finishing up a Discord game of Blood on the Clock Tower. Another fairly immersive game, Mark. Um... Ray says he thinks that John Wick Chapter 4 is still only in theaters. And he says it might be the best of the series. Ooh, that's awesome. Yeah, I'm, I'm eager to see that, Ray. I might wait for it to be coming to, uh, to st uh, streaming, but uh, maybe if it is on a local theater, I can go check it out. My friend Miles popped in to say that the Stomeyer corkscrew disc, which is Miles' uh, signature disc, he says that is essential. I see my coworker Susanna is here. Susanna, congratulations on everything happening in your life right now. I won't spoil it for people here if you don't want that to be public, but there's some stuff, exciting stuff in Susanna's life right now. Always happy to see my coworkers being happy. Uh, Carlos says, something that's missing from the progress chart are any mention of expansions. You've teased in the past that a possible expansion for Libertalia. Do you think that might still be a possibility in the near future? I think what I've teased, Carlos, is that we're working on something for Libertalia. I don't think I said it was an expansion. Um, so there is the possibility of something happening in Libertalia in the future. But uh, I... I it, it, I'm working with Paolo on it, and Paolo often has other projects, and I don't hear from him for extended periods of time sometimes. So, and I'm trying not to rush him because there is no rush for it. So, um, hopefully, something will happen. It kind of depends on it's in Paolo's hands right now. Paul says he played Euphoria for the first time and loved it. Thank you for for trying Euphoria. I really appreciate that, Paul. He says any chance the expansion shows up soon? I sign up for notifications. Uh, we currently are not making more copies of the expansion, but it isn't that we'll never make it. It's just that we're not currently making it. So once we get enough notifications that people are interested, we will make another print run of that. And it does seem like we're moving in that direction, Paul, that there is enough interest for us to do at least a small print run for Ignorance is Bliss in the future, maybe for early 2024. Tony says, speaking of expansions, as the designer, how do you know when it's time to close the book on an existing game and stop thinking or developing new content for it? I mean, that's a great question. I don't know if there's a science to it or a formula to it. For me, um, I often find that I have ideas for maybe one, one or maybe two expansions. And then after that, I'm kind of out of stuff. Like I've put everything that I have into the game. And often then that's where maybe a fan will come in and they'll have a really cool idea and I'll get, engage them as a co-designer for an expansion or two. That's essentially what we did with, with Tapestry and Scythe and other games. Um, but I also... I, 
and you've probably seen this with, you saw this with Scythe, you saw this with Tapestry, you kind of see it with Wingspan. Like we have a set number of expansions we're making for Wingspan. I want to, um, it, here's the best correlation I can make, which is my favorite movie series and my, my favorite book series, my favorite TV shows are those that ended at the right time. They didn't drag it on too long. Uh, and it really didn't drag it on at all. They told the story they wanted to tell and then they ended. And that's, it, it's different lengths for different things. Like Wingspan, you know, that's six expansions, six different continents. Um, the core game is North America. There's, uh, you know, there are trilogies of movies. There's some books, uh, book series that I love uh, that are just two books. Like the, um, the Shadow and Bone series is a bunch of little duologies within that same world. I think there are different, different times to tell, to tell a story or different lengths um, to tell a story. So I don't have an exactly, exactly good way to do that, Tony, but I, it is something that I keep in mind, I keep in mind as I think about expansions and expansion content. Like what is, what is the best way that we can wrap up this story at the right time that is respectful to fans who want more, um, and, and yet also have a lot of other games that they're pulled towards at all other times. So, um, not a great answer there, but those are the types of things that I think about for it. Andy says that uh, it's decided because my kittens were playing and managed to knock, they knocked down his nesting box off the shelf and the corner split. I love those cats, but they can drive me crazy. I'm so sorry to hear that, Andy. That's a big box to knock down. I hope, I hope they're okay. I can crush a kitten if they're not careful. That's a big, heavy box. I don't know how they would, like my nesting box is so heavy. I have to use like quite a bit of upper body strength to get it off the shelf. So you must have some strong kittens. I'm glad everyone's okay, Andy. Um, and if there's anything we can do, I want to be tentative about saying this because I want to help out with your, your crushed corner. Um, but typically for boxes, the only spare boxes we have at, uh, like that, that is the whole product. That is either the whole product, like for the nesting box, or it is, um, there's an entire game in that box. So us removing the lid from the box negates the entire game. It's the same as an, an entire game. But for the nesting box, there isn't anything inside of it. And so feel free to email customer service. Maybe we have something spare at the warehouse. Uh, while we wait for the, the third printing to arrive. I doubt it that we have anything there, but it might be worth checking. Jeff says he recommends the Mako 3. Mako 3 is a really, really good mid-range disc. And Chad says red kyber, uh, red kyber crystal. Yeah, yeah, I have a red kyber. Let's see if I can get the lid off. I do indeed have a red kyber crystal here. Here's my red kyber crystal. I think the options were red, blue, green, and purple. The purples are actually quite pretty. I, I don't think many people went for those. And no one went for the blue, actually. Yeah, so if you want to have a, a more rare lightsaber, go for the blue. Because that seemed like the one that not many people picked. Greg is popping in, joining ladies. Says, check out the mini dive Dave did at Gamma for Expeditions. Yes, uh, that was for Tabletop Gaming. I forget the, the channel. The more I see of it, the more excited I get for the, the game. David did a great job with presenting the gameplay. Uh, I totally agree. Yeah, I, I think he did. And actually, I, I had more, um, a, a bigger card reveal for the meteorites, I believe, planned for tomorrow. But tomorrow is May the 4th, Star Wars Day. So I moved that to Friday and I switched uh, my game design video for Sabacc to, uh, to tomorrow uh, instead. For me the fourth so this later this week i will have another expeditions video as well and i'm glad to hear that david did a good job presenting the gameplay my co-worker david carol says love the shirt my my wingspan early bird gets whatever it wants shirt from meeple house i believe is the company that makes this one nathan says he's excited to see that rolling realms live play game 50 is coming up soon and that is right nathan game 50 is coming up soon i have a thread that i opened on board game geek for anyone who wants to suggest a fan-made realm that i haven't already played on a, on a live play to play in game 50. i'm going to choose nine different realms to play for game 50 nine different fan created realms we did the same thing for for game 40 and that was a lot of fun so i'll keep doing that maybe every 10 maybe every 15 games um and definitely on game 50. So if you love Rolling Realms and if you have either played a fan realm that you really enjoyed or you've designed one that you're particularly proud of, feel free to nominate it on, on that thread. Julie says she went to Pieces Board Game Bar and Cafe, the place I recommended here in St. Louis this past weekend. And Julie says she played two new to us games, Isle of Sky and Rolling Realms. I didn't know. That's awesome, Julie. Thanks for giving Rolling Realms a try. And Isle of Sky is one of my favorite games of all time. 
She says, I haven't played a lot of roll and write games, but I really liked Rolling Realms. Thank you, Julie. Um, I enjoyed the puzzle aspect of figuring out how to use the dice and manipulate them with the resources. So, sort of remi reminding me of the lessons learned feature in Creature Comforts, but with many more options. Those resources were nice and helping to counter the luck of the roll, too. I also played Red Rising on my own against the Altama and was crushed. So I will have to try again. Yeah, good luck against Altama. What do you think of Isle of Sky, Julie? Did you, did you enjoy that as well? Chad says, did you ever have a feeling of claustrophobia while at the Star Wars Galactic Star Cruiser? I hear a lot of people were worried about that because you cannot look outside of the real world through a window or anything. I am someone who does get claustrophobic if I'm actually like caught in an, in an actual tight space, but I didn't get that feeling at all. Like they've made the rooms big. Even our hotel room, I got a suite. So it had two different bedrooms and a living room. So, you know, maybe maybe not whatever everyone got, but there was a lot of space in it. It was a, it was a spacious uh, living space. And I really, it was so spacious that I wish I had crammed more people into it. We had six people. I probably could have put eight in, eight in there. Um, but yeah, the atrium, every room is is nice and big. And, you know, even though we couldn't see the outside light, I, I, I never felt claustrophobic and not even close. I really didn't. And they, they let you out. Oh, and actually, crucially, Chad, I, did, I forgot to mention this in all my videos, but they had a, a weather simulator room. And that's what they called it, a weather simulator. But really, it is a room that that is uh essentially outside it's not entirely outside but it's it it's kind of like a greenhouse where the you can see the sky so if you ever need to feel like you were outside you can go to this room and you really are i'm not describing it well but it's kind of like a like a greenhouse um and it isn't simulated like the actual ceiling is a, a, a skylight into the real world and they have it there partially to prepare you for the weather for when you're dropped off on Galaxy's Edge. So that way you know if it's raining, if it's hot, if it's cold. That room it has the real world weather in it. And so I hadn't thought about this, but for anyone who is feeling, who might feel a little claustrophobic, which I think is going to be pretty rare given the amount of space they put in this, this hotel. Um, but if you are, you can go to this room and just chill for a little bit. It's a real chill room to hang out in and essentially be outside without fully being outside. Blue, uh, Corey from Blue Falcon says, did you and Megan ever start watching The Rookie? I don't know if it'll be a show for me, but um, but I Megan, I think, has tried to get into it and just uh, couldn't get into it, Corey, even, as much as she likes Nathan Fillon. Uh, we did finish watching The Dollhouse recently, which has the not a connection to Nathan Fillon, but has a connection to Joss Whedon, who created Firefly, Nathan, one of Nathan Fillon's big shows. We did finish that recently, and I, I really enjoyed it. Megan had watched it before, but it was the first time for me. Megan says she didn't start. Okay, she hasn't actually started it. So she might still start it someday when she's feeling uh, like watching The Rookie. And she's right around the corner right here. That's why I'm, I'm laughing. Uh, Carol says, this is the thing I'm talking about, the Star Wars Galactic Star Cruiser. Yeah, it's in Orlando, Florida, and it is essentially a, a fully immersive meta game set in a hotel where you really feel like you're in a galactic star cruiser for a few days i've talked about the the game within the game or the games and the many levels of the game i've talked about the the hotel the set design the i hope i talked about enough about the cast because the cast they were just incredible they learned our names so quickly um and they, by cast i mean like these are crew members some crew members and just some people who are in character on the ship and they're there to help you advance the story and help you to, to participate in the story. But they, they like learned our names. They were really good at including people in the way they wanted to be included. So they would kind of call people over and form these groups. And if they saw people who kind of like were lingering and wanted to be more active, they would, they would find a way to include them too. They were great with the kids. They were also great with the adults. Um, they were great to people of all different forms of ability and accessibility. Like there were people there with wheelchairs. Um, there were older people. There were younger people. There were couples. There were big groups of friends, like the, the group that I went with. And the cast the whole time is engaging with all these different people. It was like 150 people. And they were they were learning our names and, and, and including us in the story. The cast was incredible. And also just their, their acting skills were really good. Like uh, Saja Kier, um, the, the woman who led the lightsaber training, she she was fully in character like and, and not in like an ironic way or like a winking way like it, it was like she really did believe that the force existed and she just didn't happen to have the force and uh it their their buy-in into the story made me want to buy into it more and more every step of the way it was the cast was incredible i also talked about the food a little bit the food was really really good um 
and Galaxy's Edge itself. Galaxy's Edge itself was also fun, but after being on the Star Cruiser, the Star Cruiser is so good, and you get so much personal attention on the Star Cruiser, and there's so much engagement in the story and the things you can do there. Galaxy's Edge was fun, but not the highlight. I kind of thought that might end up being the highlight, but it wasn't at all. That it was, it was good. It was impressive. But the Star Cruiser itself was the, the place where I wanted to be all the time. Julie says, did you see any kids in the Star Wars experience? Just curious because we plan, we plan to go to Disney World when our son is a bit older and can, and, and can appreciate all the Star Wars stuff. There were kids there. Yeah, there were, um, there were teenagers. Uh, there were some younger kids. There were, I would say there, there were mostly, there were maybe around 10 families. That might be even more than there were. But yeah, around 10 families there. And they seem to be having a blast with it. I think it helps if you can read the data pad. So it's just an app that goes on your phone. So being at a reading level is great, but I think there are a lot of parents who were there with really young kids and were helping them understand uh, what was happening. So they were reading the data pad for them. Yeah, I saw, I mean, uh, I saw so many kids engage in, in so many different levels with the story. They were getting really into it. Um, there are also some teenagers that didn't seem all that into it, like, but they weren't hurting the experience for the rest of us by any means. They were just maybe not the biggest Star Wars fans, but their parents were, or their siblings were. And they kind of just wandered around and enjoyed this, enjoyed the freedom of wandering around this hotel because you have complete freedom there. But yeah, I definitely saw quite a few kids there. And yet they didn't, sometimes I'm worried that kids might get in the way of the adult experience that I want to have, and they didn't at all. The kids were great. The parents were great. The cast were great at engaging both. Um, yeah. Let me think of it, if I can think of another example with that. Uh, that but I don't want to spoil anything because there are there are spoilers to the, the experience, to the story. Pete says, anything in particular you're hoping to play a geek way? Yeah, Pete, I, I posted my least my, my list in the newsletter today. Let's see a few of the games that I'm really excited to play. Um Hi Megan. Um so a few let's see, I, I actually need to update this list because a few people have offered to teach me some of the games on this list, but some of the ones that I don't have teachers for yet, I don't think, are First Rat, Heat, uh, Four Humors, The Great Split, Bug, Bug Council of Backyardia. In fact, Pete, we should try to find a way to play Bug Council together, because I've heard great things about that, and I think it is like a trick-taking type game. Um, Claim, Space Station Phoenix, and Acropolis. I, I think I need to update that list based on comments on this thread. This is a thread that I mentioned in the uh, in this Stillmire Games newsletter. These are games that I'm hoping to play for the first time with people who already know them and already enjoy them at Geekway to the West in a few weeks. Dayton very kindly says, thank you for making a game for Red Rising. I love the books and I really enjoy the game. Thank you, Dayton. Uh, I do too, <laughs> both. And I'm, I'm glad that uh, we had the chance to make the game. Justin says, if future expedition expansions have new mechs, will there be ironclad editions of those of those expansions as well, so that our mechs will match. Absolutely. Absolutely, Justin. Yeah. Um, there are actually two spe specific places in the insert designed for expansion mechs. Uh, not that we had those mechs when I designed expeditions. It was just like, you know, there's room here. Let's make sure that we have a place if we make new mechs. So there are two specific places for mechs. And so I think there's a very good chance that we will make two more mechs for expeditions and that we will make plastic and metal versions. Another Red Rising comment here. Steven says, thanks to your game, I read the first Red Rising trilogy. That's awesome. Yeah, that's one of the reasons I wanted to make the game, to include people in the, the book series that I love so much. He says, I'm trying to decide if I should start book four. What do you think of books four and five? Uh, I really enjoy books four and five. I would say, I, so far, I'm enjoying the first trilogy more than the second trilogy, but, uh, but I am enjoying them. I'm still reading them, still loving them, still really excited about book six and book seven, because there's a book seven as well. Um, so I would recommend them. And if you start to read them now, then you might time it well with when book six comes out in the in the fairly near future. Comes out very soon, actually, I think. Uh, he says, and do you think some arguments would make an expansion for Red Rising? We toyed around with it. Uh, I think so. I think at the very least, we'll probably do some sort of like character pack to uh, add some new characters that aren't in the original game that maybe show up in the, the second trilogy of books. Something like that. Chris says, do you have any favorite components for displaying player hit points? I think I stumbled upon an idea, but I don't have knowledge of many board games. So this is a great question, Chris, for anyone who wants to chime in here. Any uh, different component, favorite ways of displaying hit points? Um, I do like dials. I think dials are nice because you uh, it's hard to, to knock a dial if it's designed correctly so that uh, 
so that it, it moves it off center. Um, so I think that works. I think tracks, like a single token on a track can work well. You can use tokens for it. Um, what are some other ways that people display hit points? You know, I think tracks, tokens, and dials are probably the, the most ways. Also, pencil and paper. You can always do that. I think some games do that as well. Lori says, I first saw your old YouTube videos about a year ago. Compared to those, uh, your past year, you've really changed your physical health, it seems. You look good. Thank you, Lori. I appreciate that. Um, and it's actually, it should go back. Uh, it should go back around three years. Around three years ago is when I went vegetarian slash sometimes pescatarian. And when I really got into doing a 20-minute daily workout. And I saw the benefits of it almost immediately. Um, I didn't even realize that I was... I was overweight beyond what my, my health should be for my, my height and, and um, my ideal body mass and things like that. But I, I was about 15 pounds overweight, and uh, now I'm, I'm much closer to my target weight. Uh, but uh, and I, you can see it in the older videos. I, 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 I look physically different if you go back to around four years ago. Um, there's definitely a difference there. And Lori says, you mentioned quitting soda. Yeah, I, that's that I was a big soda drinker before, but whenever I went to the, a movie theater, I would always get a soda and a popcorn. Now I still get the popcorn, but I don't get the soda anymore. I've had maybe three sodas in the last three to four years. Um, and I don't drink a lot of alcohol. I, I drink a little bit. Like I might have a drink a week, something like that, but I don't drink a, a lot of alcohol either. I think everything in moderation. As sweets are probably my still my my downfall. I love... I love sweets. I it, I have plenty of little treats over there. I got some some uh, treats at the at the Galactic Star Cruiser. Um, ate a lot of food at the <laughs> the Galactic Star Cruiser, really. Um, but that's my, my biggest downfall. And he said, "What made your what made you change your diet and or fitness re uh, regimen, and what changes did you do?" I had some uh, both Megan and another friend kind of encouraged me to get into a daily workout routine. For many years of my life, I played soccer a couple times a week. Um, or even every day when I was really young. And then I drifted away from that the more I dove deep into Stomar games, honestly. Uh, I should have taken more accountability for that, but I didn't. And there were there were weeks where I would go without doing anything really all that physical at all. And so I realized what I needed to do is is find a, a, a easy to do daily activity that would get my heart rate going. And so I, I now do a pretty simple core workout, a little bit of resistance workout, and then I run up and down the stairs in my building and this whole workout takes around 20 minutes every day. So it's very easy to fit into my my life without taking up too much time. And also the the change to from um, eating eating meat products to eating mostly vegetarian, I think has had a positive impact on my health as well. Not that you can't eat meat, meat and be healthy and not that you can't find a different way than working out every day. Those just those things have happened to work for me. Good morning, Sean. Uh, Susanna says, Dave demoed for Gaming Trend. Thank you, Susanna. Gaming Trend uh, on YouTube. That's the video. It's on the Expeditions page on our website if you want to check out that, that little preview as well. Sam says, have you posted content where you talk about what led up to making Viticulture Cooperative? I'd love to know how that idea came about. I'm pretty sure I talk about it in the design diaries for Viticulture World. So if you go to the Viticulture World on our website and expand the design diaries section, scroll all the way down to the first one. I think that's probably around the time where I'll talk about that. But it was just kind of an idea. I wanted to do something a little bit different for Viticulture that we hadn't done before. And I was inspired by uh, Orleone's Invasion and Spirit Island. Uh, Spirit Island is cooperative from the start. Or Orleone's Invasion is the best corollary of a great Euro game that added a cooperative exp expansion for those who wanted it. That was definitely an inspiration for the idea. Terry says, you mentioned playing Stroganoff a couple weeks back. Yes, I did. I have a video coming out about it fairly soon. Um, he says, the box art reminds me a bit of Scythe. It does a little bit. Similar setting to Scythe as well, except not an alternate history. He says, how was the game compared to Gugong, the same designer? I actually didn't realize they were designed by the same person. I can now see some similarities between the two. Lots of little mini games. Uh, I mean, the main takeaway for me that you'll hear me talk about in the video about Stroganoff is, uh, is the use of the time track. The, the many different ways the designer uses the one-way time track mechanism. At, it talk about it. I'll talk about it in the video, so I'll, I'll save it for that, but um, it's a really cool mechanism. Very different game than Gugong, but I can see the relation to the, the little mini games that you do uh, throughout both of the, of the games. Sean says, is Expeditions going to be at Geekway to the West or BGG Spring? Not sure about BGG Spring, but Geekway to the West, we are air mailing in a few copies to be in the play and win 
at Geekway to the West. So it will be at Geekway to the West for sure. And I think I asked them to send the Ironclad edition. So we'll have some special versions at Geekway to the West that you can play and potentially win. We are all uh, also still on track for July fulfillment for the pre-order. Um, the production should wrap up in about two weeks. Uh, I will have advanced reviewer copies then too. So you might see some advanced re reviews in mid-June and then we'll uh, do fulfillment in July. We are now sold out in the U.S. of the first wave of the Ironclad edition, but because of the pre-order system, we were able to get a great head start on the second wave. And so we should be shipping that about a month after the original first pre-order wave. Let's see, Andy says he has no idea how his cats managed to knock the nesting box off his shelf. They're both so small, it's a heavy box. He says, everyone is okay. Is okay. I'm glad to hear that. I will try to reach out to customer service, uh, but the cats are okay and that's what matters most. Yeah. Well said, Andy. I'm glad your cats are okay. And I wish my cats would like my new lightsaber, but they are they are terrified. The sound. They don't like the sound of the lightsaber. Hilda's here. Hilda gave me some wonderful recommendations for Orlando that we didn't get to any of because we, we went to Orlando just for the Star Cruiser. And it was absolutely worth the, the long weekend trip just for the Star Cruiser. But I do wish we could have tried some of the, rec the, um, the restaurant recommendations that Hilda mentioned there. So Hilda, thank you for popping in to say hi and for giving me those recommendations. Chris says he works remotely for Universal Orlando Resort, so I'll definitely check it out. Check out the Star Wars Hotel when I visit. Yeah, I hope you get the chance to, to try it, Chris. And it is more than a hotel. Like, I, I do wonder someday if it will be like the full experience on the weekends and just a hotel during the week, because it would be an awesome hotel to stay at, even if you don't have the full story experience that they put on for, uh, for everyone who opts into that. Because uh, I it, most importantly, I want this thing to be sustained. I think it is worth anyone trying this experience once, if you are a Star Wars fan, or even just a gamer who likes immersive experiences, the Star Wars Galactic Star Cruiser, I think is worth trying once, but it is a very expensive couple of days to try. So it's something that you would have to save up for. And um, Obviously, I'm hoping the price goes down a little bit so more people can experience it. But I see, given like how much production went into making it exist in the first place, plus how much goes into the cast and the crew who are amazing, and there are a lot of them all around all the time, I can see why it, it costs so much. I get it. Julie says, uh, we did like Isle of Sky. Julie played Isle of Sky for the first time recently. She says, it felt like a successful mash mashup of several games we're familiar with like Carcassonne, King Domino, King Domino, the goal system for cartographers, uh, which came after Isle of Sky, and the price setting for Castle of Mad King Ludwig. Yeah, you're mentioning some of my favorite games here, and I can see why I love it so much. Um, yeah, you're right. It does combine a lot of those different mechanisms. It has the, the catch-up mechanism from Quacks of Quinlanburg, although Isle of Sky did it first as well. Maybe I should do I didn't realize how many games that Isle of Sky may have inspired as a result of those mechanisms. Although Castles of Mech and Ludwig may have come before it, but I'm pretty sure cart cartographers came after it. I'm almost positive that Quacks came after it too. Uh, Carcassonne definitely came first though. Chet says, did you bring any sci-fi games into the Star Cruiser to play? Uh, Megan and I played the Star Wars deck building game right before we left. I figured we were gonna be very busy the whole time, so we didn't bring any games to play. I, a, a friend brought some games to play like a, while we were traveling, but we didn't end up getting to them. I just played Sabacc, a few games of Sabacc, which they had the, the card game version, and they also had a digital, a big digital kind of arcade version that helped people learn how to play so they could participate later in the tournament. Another example of how they kind of onboarded you from one experience to the next at the Star Cruiser. Mark says, any restocks for Euphoria and, and its expansion soon? Probably not until 2024, Mark. So not, not anytime soon. Hmm. Pete says, any trick takers in the library at Geekway will be played. He'll be learning Bug Council. That's awesome. Pete's a lot of fun to play games with. So if you see my friend Pete at, uh, at Geekway, uh, he is a master of trick taking games. Um, as is Dave, my coworker Dave, and, and my friend Henry, they do too. Lots of trick-taking lovers in my group. It's one of the reasons that I've gotten so into it. I'm, I'm looking forward to playing some, including Bug Council of Backyardia at Geekway to the West. Susanna says that Acropolis is cool. Oh, that's, that's great that you know how to play it. She said she played a Geekway Mini. I also want to play First Rat, and she already owns it. Hard to find time for new games sometimes. Susanna, let's try to find a way to play, play First Rat together. I'd love to play that game. Um, I didn't know that you owned it, but yeah, I, I, I need to play it. 
Chen says that Unmatched has great dials for HP. So check out the dials in Unmatched. I like the dials that we made for Libertalia um, for tracking HP. The one thing that they don't do well, although it's, they're tracking wealth in Libertalia. But one catch with dials is that sometimes a dial is really good at showing you your HP, your, your hit points, your life, your, your wealth, whatever it is, but not as good at showing other players what it is. Dials kind of can hide that um, by accident or by design. So keep that in mind if you're thinking about dials for HP. A dice, Steve mentioned that dice can be used to track it. An app can be used to track it too. Like in, when I play Magic, I use a little app that, that lets me track my life. Uh, Jerry, I see your question about my 20 minute daily workout routine. I, I think I answered it a few minutes later. I'm in the future now, um, but uh, let me know if you want more details about that. I'm happy to provide them. Chat says, how do your neighbors feel about you running up and down the stairs all the time? You know, I was worried about it for a while, but I don't think they can hear me do it. Uh, it's, it's 10 minutes a day that I spend actually on the stairs running up and down. I live in a building where we each have our own floor of the building. And so the staircase isn't, I don't think it's really, un, I don't think there are any rooms under it. So I don't think I'm bothering my neighbors, but maybe I should ask them sometime to check and make sure. Julie says I should ch check out the World of Chocolate Museum in Orlando if I ever go back. It has giant models of world monuments made out of solid chocolate, and you get the taste test of various types of chocolate on the tour. That would be my first question, and you'd be answered it, Julie. I'm glad to hear that. Um, that's really cool. That's awesome. I did see Julie here in St. Louis. Cacao is doing Star Wars molded chocolates for Star Wars Day tomorrow, um, May the 4th. I'm tempted to get them, but I'm also a little worried to get them because I don't want to eat them. But I also do want to eat them because cacao makes really good chocolate. Chris says, question on damage for shipped items. Seen a few damage reports for Isofarian Guard, or the heavy box, but as it is typical, they are unable to replace boxes. Are these not are these not insured generally and therefore the company company covered from the sunk cost? Asking to educate to so better understanding can be offered to all. So Curtis, I will say this. Um, and I, I don't want to speak for other publishers. I can speak for Stomar Games. If you order a game from us and it arrives damaged, that is a time where we will find a way to replace the game. Typically, what we will do then, and this is a recommendation to other companies, I think it works pretty well, is say, Curtis, say you buy Wingspan from us and the box arrives damaged. Um, that is our responsibility, even though it's technically the courier's responsibility, it's our responsibility to take care of it. And so what we'll often have you do is we will find a reviewer who wants a copy of Wingspan and we will pay for, we will create a shipping label for you to put on the box and ship to that reviewer. No cost to you, maybe a few minutes, but not, not much of a cost to you uh, other than time uh, to ship to that reviewer because the reviewer doesn't need a pristine box. They just need a game that they can play. And then we'll reship the game to you. That's our responsibility, and that's a way for us to get utility out of the game. The game isn't wasted; um, it's still going to a good good use. And it's not always a reviewer. Sometimes it's uh, you know a donation some other way, but oftentimes it is a reviewer. I think the difference happens when, and, and I'll use Andy as an example here. Andy had his cats playing around; they knocked the game off the shelf. Uh, they knocked his nesting box off the shelf. We'll keep using Wingspan as an example here. If they had knocked his Wingspan box off the shelf. We don't have a good way to replace that. We could replace it in the same way that we replace uh, orders. But at that point, it is a little bit out of our responsibility um, to replace that box. Uh, if it is something that just happens in your life where a box gets damaged or lost or whatever. I, I hear from people decently all the time who say, you know, I, I have a nesting box or a legendary box now, and I kind of miss the old box top. Could I have a box top? We don't have box tops laying around. Every box top we have for Wingspan has a copy of Wingspan inside that box. So that box top is worth $60 or $65. And the shipping on top of it, it's not all that responsible to ship a, a, you know, an empty box halfway around the world unless that box has a huge purpose, like a legendary box or a nesting box. So that's where we don't have boxes. But back to my point, I think there is a way, I think there is responsibility for the original shipment of the product to arrive in mint condition. And if that doesn't happen, there are ways that are mutually beneficial for both the publisher and the customer to, uh, to get something out of that experience. So the customer can still get their mint condition game and the damage box can end up in the hands of someone who can still use it in a way that might even benefit the, uh, the publisher. Long answer, but that's, uh, that's my take on it. Oh, and I didn't even answer your question. Are these not generally insured? So dealing with complaints for cur with couriers is incredibly time consuming and often not worth the time to the money that you might get back from it. So 
almost never worth the time. They hardly ever, they run you through so many different hoops to, uh, to, uh, to get you to get your, your money back that it, it's hardly ever worth it to do, unfortunately. Mark says, are, are there plans to tease the upcoming promo realms like the stack of promo realms you did before? I know, Mark, you want me to, to share the, the stack. Um, I have heard that before. I need to do it. It's just the reason I haven't done it is that it does take uh, a bit of time because I have to. I have all the realms that I have sorted. So I basically, in my cabinet of, of secrets back here, I have a bunch of realms and they're sorted in set so i have like six of of one realm and then i have six of another one so for me to um i have to take one out of each of those segments stack them up take a photo and then put them back in all those segments or they'll be disorganized later so i need to do it but i haven't done it yet <laughs> so woodstock said just published my first game congratulations woodstock games that's awesome how important do you think going to co conferences or conventions um so our games i've We've built the game, the company around not really going to conventions. I think it is a fun way to engage with fans or potential fans and existing fans if it is also fun for you. But if that isn't something that you get excited about, there are plenty of ways to engage with the gaming community online. Like what I'm doing right now. I'm not at a convention, but I'm here face to face talking to you. I'm, I'm actively, hopefully building and being a part of this community. So there are many ways to do that without actually going to conventions and conventions also they're at best often just a way to break even. You, most publishers, most creators end up losing money on conventions. Maybe in the long run, they make that money back. But that's why I'm saying if it's fun for you, go for it. Give it a try. Try one convention, see if it's a good fit. Try a couple different sizes of conventions to see what's a good fit. Um, but uh, it is not a part of our marketing strategy, hardly at all, until fairly recently where I did hire someone, my coworker Dave, who... Uh, Dave is kind of in charge of part of his job as being in charge of conventions so we can grow it a little bit, but it still will not ever, I think, be a major part of our marketing strategy. We'll, we'll just hit a few conventions here and there. So people who enjoy conventions and enjoy connecting with publishers through conventions can have that experience with us as well, which they don't currently have other than really at, at, at Geekway and at Gen Con. Chen says, what's your favorite a uh, war game, a uh, war game, Chen, I think is what you're saying. Yeah, my favorite war game, I don't even know if I have a favorite war game. I don't play many games with with a direct conflict, direct combat between players. Um, the closest I would say is maybe Kemet. I really enjoy Kemet. I'm a little over time today, but that's okay. Megan's picking up lunch kindly today, so uh, I have a few extra minutes. Kate says, I really want to try the Galactic Star Cruiser experience. Yeah, that's what I've been talking about a lot today. Kate, thanks for chiming in. Um, she says, I can get 30% off on certain weekends. Do that. Yeah, that's 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 actually quite a bit of money. Um, she says, I, I've never known someone that's actually done it. I look forward to seeing your video with more in-depth thoughts. Uh, even I, I talked for 50 minutes in my video the other day about yesterday when I filmed it, that it, hopefully it'll go live this Sunday. And even then, I, I feel like there are big things that I left out by accident because there's it's so much. It's so Awesome. I so really do recommend it, especially if you can get 30% off. Absolutely. If you can get a discount, if you ever see a discount on the Star Cruiser, go for it. Absolutely go for it. Chet says, any feedback from Gamma Expedition civilian players? Not that I've heard. No, not yet. I, I'm sure I'll get some great feedback to hopefully incorporate it into an expansion someday, but I, I haven't gotten any yet. Mark says, on the, prob on the topic of problematic shipments, my last order was missing items and I reported it accordingly. And I would say that some of our games um, have been answering, but not either works. It's good to know. I'm worried that I might not get my missing items by the time I place another order via the Australia web store. Mark, that is very good to know. Can you send, uh, can you send us an email about that? Because that's something that we'd really like to prioritize and, and make happen. I'm sorry that you haven't gotten the communication that you deserve. So send an email, if you don't mind, Mark, to contact at stillmeyer.com, explaining what's going on and explaining, uh, sharing the, the order number and maybe uh, forwarding your last communication from Aetherworks so we can get to the bottom of it and help out with that. Aetherworks is generally pretty good with that kind of stuff. So maybe there's something going on that, I, that we don't know about, um, but we can help and we will help. So please let us know. I also didn't even, didn't even mention my recent content that I already posted. I did a video about replayability this past weekend, how you can make 15 different ways that you can make your game more replayable. And I did a post about uh, getting more done, a uh, little method that I've learned about breaking bigger tasks into preparation and execution phases uh, has helped me get a lot more done in my, my work life and personal life at times. So 
I did a post about that last Thursday. So I think Megan's picking up lunch and is texting me. Oh, no. Oh, Megan thinks that my video is done. She doesn't know that I'm still live here. So I should probably head on out in a second. Paul has a good question about uh, Red Rising real quick. He says, how many, how did you figure out how many points to make cards? I wouldn't even know where to start. You know, I'm not very good at that, Paul. I'm, it's really hard for me to get a starting point with that. And so what I generally do is that I kind of just guess at first. I, I put a point value on, on a card. Sometimes I don't put any points on cards at the beginning and I play without the points and figure out which cards feel more or less uh, powerful than other cards. I will say for Red Rising, one thing that I did think a lot about is I wanted to make the numbers, the points on the cards easy to add up. And so you notice that all the numbers in, in or all the, yeah, almost all the numbers in, in Red Rising are either uh, end with a five or a zero, um, divisible by five, or if it's like a, a card that has a combination of points that aren't exactly that, that they could add together to form uh, oftentimes a, a number with a zero. So there might be a card that's worth like 13 points, but if you do this other thing, you get to add 17 points. 17 plus 30 is easy math. Um, so yeah, try to do that. Try to think about that, easy math. Carlos says, have I seen Disney Lorcana? Are you interested? I'm absolutely interested. Yeah, definitely. I want to see what they did with this game. I have been uh, following along and learning more about it as we go. I haven't gotten to play it yet though. Um, and I haven't even found a way to really order it yet either. I would love to, a way to order it. Maybe I'll look on on a few different websites to see if there's a place where I can order it. But I'm, yeah, I'd, I'd love to play it sometime. All right, uh, looks like we wrapped up. Thank you all for letting me rave about the Galactic Star Cruiser today. I'm happy to answer any other questions that you have in the comments below, or you can wait for my video this Sunday when I'll definitely go deep dive. You'll see a lot of images there. We're gonna put images on the screen so you can see what I was actually talking about, what I was experiencing. And uh, yeah, we'll go, we'll go deep into that. But um, yeah, thank you for joining me today for Newsletter Day and have a great Wednesday. Take care. Bye. May the fourth be with you. Thank you, Chad, for throwing that in at the end. May the fourth be with you indeed.